opportunity that was uh, offered to him to look into the whole uh, parent space. And uh, there's a saying on, uh, you know, sometimes you don't recognize a gift for uh, that's given to you. So when that opportunity was offered, um, Govind was absolutely not interested in payments at all and didn't really think that was something he should take up. But after he thought about it some more, he says that he took it up because of the lifetime impact he can create by actually innovating and disrupting uh, payments in India. And with that, you know, today he is uh, giving run for the money, if uh, I may say that, for, uh, <laughs> you know, some in the fintech uh, broad uh, space, but in the payment space. And also says this has been the most fulfilling part of his uh, life journey. So to all those entrepreneurs who at times feel, should I be doing this? And, uh, you know, am I going to succeed at it? I hope we get some takeaways and lessons from uh, uh, Govind. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Yashish likewise shares this common trait to all successful entrepreneurs, which is the ambition to, dis a burning ambition to disrupt something which seems almost impossible. And he's clearly done that with uh, deep perseverance and his own core conviction and, his and, and being a leader to a team that was willing to follow him not when things are good, which they are today, but when they were not, in looking at the whole insurance space and disrupting that. So both of them have picked very difficult spaces with lots of unknowns and have clearly succeeded. And on a personal note, I'm really envious of uh, Yashish because I found out that he is a gold medalist in swimming and he did the Ironman in Sweden and he won the Delhi International Triathlon and all that means is he has a life, unlike many <laughs> entrepreneurs. And there's some takeaways on that. Maybe we should just make the whole session about that. So, but uh, with that, um, you know, from both of you, the first thing that would be fantastic is a couple of takeaways on how you have managed to achieve scale, which few companies do, uh, uh, few startups do, and fewer even do in fintech. So, Love to get your takeaways from your learnings on that. Okay, thank you. So, uh, you know, if I recollect seven, eight years ago when we started, uh, we were, uh, unlike Perception, we were definitely not the first, and we were also not the most funded at that stage. But I think there was a very deep conviction, very, very deep conviction that something wrong is going on in the insurance industry. And uh, that came from consumer feedback. Uh, so I have had only, you know, two, two tenets of kind of uh, since the last seven, eight years. Uh, one is survival, because my dad is in the army and he said, if you don't survive tomorrow, you won't fight tomorrow. So what's the point? So uh, survival was very critical. And the second was saying, staying true to the passion, which was, let's create good products for the insurance cons uh, consumers and let's somehow convince them that these products are right for them. Very difficult, extremely difficult, because, uh, you know, as you heard in the previous presentation, customers are not willing to engage on insurance. So uh, it is not a problem of is there a right platform for them to purchase? Is there a low-cost platform for them to purchase? You know, genuinely, that is not the problem. Genuinely, the problem is there's nobody willing to get up in the morning and say, today I want health insurance or today I want life insurance. And I think uh, uh, over the last seven, eight years, I have stayed true to those two facts. So never gone away from creating a good product for the consumers and uh, never done any kind of, uh, you know, product to a consumer which is not value-add for him. So there's a whole plethora of products out there and the industry does not like us very much for it, which we do not sell. We just don't. They, they can give us much higher margins, way higher margins, and there are ways to convince the consumer they're good for them. We just haven't done it. And I think uh, the second thing is we have survived. And, you know, we could have died many times. So I think those are the two pieces and kind of staying to that for the last seven, eight years has kind of got us some scale. Well, I would echo some of what uh, Yashi said. I mean, you know, I, before this I was in Etel Money, which is also into payments, and now we're at free charge, right? I think one fundamental uh, truth is really about focus. Yeah, Yesh has really spoke about the focus on insurance. Yeah, in a large organization like Etel, it's really difficult to find the right focus that, and passion that you need to win. Yeah, uh, I think in FreeCharge, what we've done in the last few months, eight nine months since we pivoted from being a site which is more about deals to really about payment, is really the focus on payments that we brought. I don't think uh, you know any other large organization would have bought. 
And this is the founding energy that any startup can bring. Yeah. So I think that's that's very critical. I think the second thing is that uh, you know in in the fintech industry or even in payments or maybe even other industries, there is this old adage: uh, the way to the heart, a man's heart is to the stomach. Right. And you know we focused on really good experiences on on a bit of like a marketplace where you know you can do a recharge, you can do a uh, um, bill payment and so on and so forth. Because what we are focused on is we are focused on building habit. We believe that our first goal really is to get the consumer to move from a habit of using cash to a habit of using digital payment. And it really does not matter which category it is. Uh, really, you've got to start move, doing building habit. And this is a very antithesis of what a bank does. A bank is focused on a, an average electronic transaction. A bank is four thousand to ten thousand rupees. Yeah. An average transaction on our wallet is five hundred bucks. Yeah. So I think um, you know we. We have a very clear goal or a roadmap of how we think we'll build the business, and the first step of building that business in payments may not actually be uh, really what many other people consider a payments industry, but but a step that actually gets the consumer to buy into you, uh, and I think uh, that's a big part of our success. And for time immemorial, Freecharge has really been really super focused on the user experience. I think we have fantastic user experiences. Uh, I would say it's. I mean, even after some people in the room came and told me how good it was. It always feels good to hear that. Uh, and you know, that I think is a part of culture. That is the founding culture. That's something that Kunal Shah brought to the table, uh, and is very much a part of our DNA at Freecharge to make sure that uh, that user experience is the best that it can be. Um, so, if there are some use cases which we can't do within three clicks. If there are some use cases that we can't process within 10 seconds on our uh, wallet, we won't do it. And uh, market opportunity, right? Because uh, there are a lot of young companies here. So when you first started the company, have you thought about what your opportunity was and what your impact could be? To today, how do you see that? How has that changed or evolved? So uh, we were fairly conservative in that. In fact, I remember our, uh, our first presentation to InfoEdge when we raised money from them. We told them that in six years we will do 22 crores of revenue, uh, and we did about 26.2. So we did slightly better than what we projected about five years earlier. Uh, I think we understood very well that while the insurance industry was large, it was uh, two, three crore, uh, you know, lakhs crores. Uh, that was the wrong way of looking at the industry because uh, that was for the missell products. You know, the moment you take the missile out of it, the industry becomes extremely, extremely small. So, uh, basically, I define missile as a product that you can see fully, understand fully, and then still purchase, right? So, if it is, that is not the case, then it's a missile. Then the industry becomes very, very small. So, for example, the pure life insurance industry in the country is still about three, four hundred crore rupees only. Now, for me to project that yes, every person needs to be insured, and it's a very large opportunity, is very true. But uh, you know, it may take forever for that to happen because today, uh, you know, even in this room, which is fairly educated people and all of us earn money and our families are dependent on us, I can pretty uh, confidently say not a majority would have life insurance. How so, many do you have life insurance? that's actually surprisingly high. The remaining, please <laughs> check out the website today. Okay. So, you know, health insurance people try to go for when somebody falls sick and when they really require it, etc. So, I think for the person who really needs it, for my Mali to get up and say, I need health insurance of 50,000 rupees and I need life cover, it's a long way off. And, uh, you know, the, the current uh, ecosystem, it's going to be difficult. It's going to take a long time. Uh, yes, the market is huge. The insurance industry globally is, uh, last I checked, was five, six trillion dollars. Uh, yeah, you can kind of, you can kind of calculate backwards any amount. It's a huge industry. So you're industry. saying the long short is great, in the short run, be conservative and you know don't have unrealistic expectations. I think let's focus on what we can achieve uh, tomorrow, next month, next quarter. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, you know really pulled up by a lot of my co-founders for looking at sales at two o'clock, five o'clock, and eight o'clock. But uh, but I do that because that is what is important. Otherwise, next month I won't be there. So you know uh, I think both are important. You have to have a strategy and you have to survive. You can't just stick to one. I mean, uh, you know, FreeCharge, when we started, when FreeCharge started, it was really focusing on deals and that was the way that, uh, you know, that the opportunity is. And we've pivoted midway to really trying to become a really payments kind of company. 
I think the big advantage or the big sort of uh, focus for us is, you know, Nandan talked about it today, but internally we call it, we call it prepaid banking. Yeah, you know, uh, 20 years ago, 4% of this country had a mobile phone. I mean, had a phone, had access to a phone. Uh, today, 4% of this country has access to financial services. Yeah. So what we really see is we see a huge opportunity really to go after that uh, segment where we can provide an, a marketplace where consumers can consume this uh, financial service. And, you know, who knows? I mean, we feel that it might be 10 years, it might be 20 years. But what's clear is, uh, you know, it, that change is going to happen. Yeah. And that change, the change is going to happen. For the change to happen, you need to have a platform where consumers have trust. That trust cannot be built only by one product. That trust is built when consumers uh, come to that platform regularly, and that consumers use that platform for some sort of transaction where money is used, which is why we think that the payment is the right way uh, to actually build that financial marketplace. Yeah. And, that's our, and that's what we focused on. We have focused on, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing in the, in the payments business, I'm sure it's true for the rest of fintech. It's like an iceberg. What you really see uh, is just a one-tenth of it. Uh, you know, the most important metric I track on an everyday basis is uh, how many, what percentage of refund went back within one minute for a failed transaction. Because that is the biggest cause of, it, of distrust. And in a money business, if you do distrust, then you can't build anything else. Right? So I think the way we look at it, uh, there's a huge opportunity in this country. We've seen this happen in uh, mobile, uh, in telephone. Uh, you know, I was a title. I've seen that story play out. And, uh, and you know, we think that at this point in time, uh, building out a financial, building out a marketplace for financial products starts with payments, uh, which is a journey. You know. Now, how many of the companies here are funded? Okay. So the next question is very, very relevant. And I have a bit of an unfair advantage because I know the funding history of both the uh, companies. But for our conversation here, what are, what, you know, and when you are in an industry that you know sea change will come, has to come, you don't know exactly when that is going to happen, that critical inflection point. And fintech industry, despite the optimism, is going to be one of those industries. It's not exactly an e-commerce industry. Uh, you know, there's a stickiness to it, but that takes a while to build. So in, in, and in that situation that many of the companies will be and you were, what are your sort of takeaways uh, from your own experience, but, but also what you share with them in the context of funding and fundraising? Yeah, so, uh, you know, before I get there, uh, Vani, I also was kind of reviewing the last answer a bit, and I don't want people to get the wrong idea here that strategy is not important. I think from a volume perspective, very important to have a very in-depth understanding of what your market size actually is, and not just look at the overall market and assume everything can be yours. I think um, as far as funding is concerned, uh, I don't think uh, there, was, there has since 2008 ever been a dearth of funding. Uh, I think there is, there, there, uh, of course, in the long run, everything's going to be super bright. Uh, the question is, uh, you know, I, I remember that kind of dialogue from, I don't know if you've seen that movie, Aurangzeb. He says in India, everything will happen. But will you be the one who make, takes advantage of when it happens is probably the most important question. And, <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, somewhere, uh, uh, I think both investors and entrepreneurs uh, need to uh, have that very, very strong and deep realization of that part, that will this be the entity that will actually take advantage of the transformation, or are they going to run along and kind of, at some point, just say, hey, you know what, this is not making money, or this is not doing something, and just kind of give up on it. I, I don't know, and it's very difficult to tell. It's a very difficult task for investors specifically. For entrepreneurs, it's much easier, because it's your idea, so we all love it. Uh, but I think extremely difficult uh, task. and. Uh, uh, I would say, at least at early stage, it is uh, much more important. The, so when I look at early stage entrepreneurs, and you guys would do your own thing, I look at how long they have done what they said they were going to do in the past, whatever it be. So if I see somebody who's changing jobs every two years or changing things every six months, then I kind of, I'm like, yeah, this guy's going to run as long as there's money, right? So it's not, the future is not different from the past. The future is the past. You know, we are all, uh, but if somebody spent four or five years building something, whether it was an Airtel, whether it was in something else, then that person probably has a chance of doing something else also because, you know, life is tough. Yeah, tomorrow something is going to happen, right? Uh, we all wanted to go to a friend's party in Manali. You know, there's 
this crash is everywhere <laughs> we are we are here you know so there are going to be issues uh, like crashes on the road road slides and all some people will make it some people won't but the point is there's going to be ups and downs and i think in that stage the people who are showing some ability of achieving something have a chance of actually achieving something that's the only point i would say and there are many ways to kind of see that uh, all organizations have that you know when when a png hires when a mckinsey hires they ask you for your achievements in school you know all those kind of things so i think those things are important so varing i mean uh, you, of course you have an insight track into what i'm going to say uh, but you know the important thing i think if i just summarize this is go deep before you go wide yeah i mean um, of course we have momentum uh, and that's the great thing but you know when we look at investors such as you who come and talk to us or whoever else i think the thing that um, everybody looks for is are you really making a difference to at least one set of consumers lives yeah are you getting a lot of traction at least in the slice and i would say that uh, you know our most important metric from that perspective is not the scale that we have or not the momentum that we have but the fact that we have tremendous amount of retention that consumers keep coming back all the time yeah i think that those are early indicators of success right and what we what i find is that if you have those early indicators of success where like as you said you do, you've done what you said you do there's a huge amount of retention you're winning in a in a cohort even though it's not maybe the largest cohort in the country then i think uh, the conversations are more uh, smooth and of course there is uh, in fintech is a, fintech is also a bit of a technology bit of a specialist kind of industry where you know some past experience in investing in previous fintech is uh, gives people perspective Uh, otherwise some people tend to look at the pnl of this and uh, look at the cash flow of this and get scared yes but otherwise uh, i would say that go deep before you go so i think that the queue for something don't know what but <laughs> so uh, you know nandan talked about uh, behavior uh, trends in india there's a lot of that in his talk so taking off of what you said um Uh, go in and I'll start this question with you and go to Yashi Shields. What are the big core behavior trends for India that we should all uh, be excited about and track in the context of this sector? What do you uh, look for and what are you excited from India-specific behavior trends? I think uh, one of the big changes that we're seeing at least in the last six months is that consumers are getting comfortable transacting on the mobile. You know, a year or two ago, you would have said people have trust issues. Yeah. but today maybe it is because of e-commerce uh, maybe it's because they bought tickets on irctc they got comfortable uh, sort of dealing on the mobile there was a recent google bcg report that came out that actually also said that look uh, actually trust is no longer uh, uh, the biggest barrier and i think that's fantastic news for all of us uh, it that trust might have come for transacting on the mobile because they started out buying at snap deal rather than uh, because they started free charge but whatever it is whether it's iactc whether it's snap deal amazon whoever did it i think that's a big thing that's that's come forward i think the second thing which uh, still a bit bit of an issue in india that we need to be clear is that at least in the fintech space it doesn't look like paper is going away too fast i mean i know we've talked about it uh, so at some point in time uh, you know from a, it may not be from a consumer behavior perspective uh, i think that in, in, this is a case in which the consumers will be ahead of uh, you know what the regulations are the consumers will adopt new technology the third thing that i've seen at etel um, is that consumers are no slouches in adopting technology uh, you know there has never been a quarter where our data growth has not been more than we thought it would be yeah uh, people say that no you know consumers don't understand this don't i think that's gone consumers are consumers are willing to adopt technology consumers are happy about experimenting and i think uh, those days are gone when you know there were trust issues on transacting on the mobile and i think that's great news for all of us I think uh, on um, the insurance front, at least, uh, consumers are becoming a lot more aware. Uh, more quality consumers are coming in. The conversion rates are are fast improving. There is demand for uh, risk-based products. Uh, all those things are happening. Uh, I think um, the, the, the paper has is is there for about 30 percent of the transactions. About 70 percent of transactions today are actually fairly paperless on on the insurance front. Uh, but uh, somewhere the need for uh, uh, communication before transaction has not so if you if somebody is buying a health insurance for example if i was buying a health insurance it's very difficult to do that without you know 
speaking, meeting, etc., etc. Because there's a lot of data out there, a lot of lot of nuances out there, very difficult uh, for a consumer to understand in like uh, in just the digital format. Because just too many parameters for just the digital format. Yet I'm sure that will hopefully change over time. Uh, so the latest piece is about 90 minutes of talk time in buying a health insurance policy. And uh, on the on the second hand, when I look at how long does a person take to finally make up his transaction, so about 70% of transactions that happen on our platform actually have started about six to nine months ago. So the person first came then, then he kind of went around, he kind of spoke to somebody, didn't really get convinced, came back again, then something else. And uh, that is where somewhere the call center person building a rapport with him to make the transaction happen, happen has become very important. One more stat which we figured, I figured recently, very you know wrong of me to figure it so recently, is that about 30% of customers who buy insurance from us have never visited us uh, on health insurance. I'm talking uh, motor, etc. has all moved digital, so that's that's fine. That's about 70-80% digital, motor, two-wheeler, travel, etc. And so that that piece is increasing. But on health insurance, 30% of the customers actually refer customers. So it is old customers referring other customers. Um, and that is happening because of the call center relationship, not because of our site. So they're not saying I had a great relationship with Policy Bazaar. It's I had a great relationship with Aman Singh at your call center, and so I want to refer somebody to him. Uh, so I think um, every every model has its nuances. Health insurance is still there. Life insurance is still there. Two-wheeler, travel, uh, and uh, uh, motor insurance. We have, like, how do I put it? We, we do about... Uh, 30 transactions per agent per day. So that can't be assistance. Oh, that's what I'm saying. So that can't be assistance. So that part has moved. Uh, I think uh, that's that's basically what's going on in the in the market. What we are really hoping for is that through all these changes, some of the, uh, you know, the 30% experience changes. The 30% who still has to do paper, uh, their experience somehow changes. Because uh, that is still a pain point for, uh, for an insurance purchaser. So today, if you wanted to buy a health insurance, let's say from company A, and you go ahead, they do a medical, you already paid, after 15 days they tell you, sorry, you can't purchase this policy. So now what do you do? Now you go to another insurance company, they say, I will not accept that company's medical, you have to do a medical again. Again, 45 days over, who does the guy blame? The guy blames Policy Bazaar. He's not blaming those companies. Uh, so that 20% or 30% is 90% of complaints. And, uh, you know, uh, what, what one is hoping is that through whatever partners we etc can bring on so if you ask me my next one and a half years will be around that to try and improve the experience of that 30 percent who today cannot buy in a seamless manner no what if you can just add something um, you know there is also this preponderance of thought that you know cashback is the one thing that's really driving transactions right i'll give you a, a, some stat that you know stunned me actually uh, when i looked at consumers uh, on the we have an nps track that goes out quite frequently almost every day on the NPS track, we looked at consumers who didn't sort of uh, give us good scores, right? Predominantly, they were because they said, no, we want more cash back. Yeah. Went back and looked at the retention numbers. They were 20% higher than average. Yeah. Which means that actually the guys who didn't give, didn't respond to our NPS were the guys who never came back. Yeah. But the, but really what this shows is convenience, I mean, maybe, uh, you know, because consumers have started transacting on many other websites, convenience has now become a big driver of these transactions. It's no longer, uh, you know, just cash back and people are doing it because they're getting something for free. I think that's a, that's a great place to be. Yeah, that's a good place to be because uh, for any of these businesses to be sustainable, uh, that becomes important. And on that context, Govind London talked about high volume, low value. And you had privately talked to me about trends like prepaid banking, yeah. right? So how do you take this notion of high volume, low value, and apply that to your own industry, even if you don't currently have products rolled out to that. How do you see that disrupting your particular industry? So let's talk about financial products, right? Um, you know, um, 36 rupees a minute was when postpaid started. Yeah. And uh, then prepaid came. And I know, I was living in US and call home every week for yeah. five minutes with the yeah. same conversation. Did you eat? Did you sleep? Yeah. That's all we could have told. Yeah, <laughs> You know, uh, I called my boss once, a guy called Anand Kripalu, who is uh, now the CEO of uh, um, Diageo. So he told me, look, Govind, what you're talking about is not worth this call, not the cost of this call. You know, that was the cost of uh, making that call, right? Then. And then obviously, uh, then, we, then, you know, prepaid came. How did prepaid come first? It came in cards and people just scratched the back of the cards and they entered some code into that, uh, into that USSD 
ugly ussd pop up and then you know it went through. i think the same thing is going to happen to banking the same thing is going to happen to financial products i mean today the average cost or the average amount of money that goes into a mutual fund is 4000 bucks why should it not be 100 why should it not be 10 rupees yeah. uh, why should uh, you know why should it be so large uh, and you know i keep going back to that 4% comment um, telecom was a direct line at home 4% of consumers had it in 1995 when jyoti basu built the first call on a mobile right uh, today 4% of people have uh, access to mutual funds and i think the numbers uh, i mean that was a 4% industry this is a 4% industry and i think if we can do this magic of upis uh, magic of uh, india tax auth uh, then you know then the only game in town is uh, really about getting consumer awareness going uh, and i really see this 4% industry now becoming a 100% industry and that's actually good news for everybody yeah so uh, i know i might i might be sort of answering one of your questions before but you know when you go to a bank one of the biggest questions that they're not able to answer is are you a friend or are you an enemy it's a question that they really are not clear but i then go back to the atm experience when atms first game banks didn't want to really roll it out yeah because what i mean why do you want to pay 15 rupees or 18 rupees per transaction uh, what then happened was that instead of the consumer pulling out 10000 rupees in the beginning of the month he started pulling out 5000 rupees in the beginning of the month then 2000 rupees in another tranche 2000 rupees in another tranche. actually kasa went up it didn't go down yeah second uh, you know instead of spending 50 to 100 rupees per transaction in a teller uh, you actually spent 18 rupees in a transaction which is cheaper yeah. think of the same thing for cash uh, today instead of spending 15 to 18 rupees per transaction in an atm the bank can actually make some income if that money is actually moved digitally so i think uh, if we go prepaid i mean there is uh, enough market not just for the current incumbents but uh, to support the current incumbents but for the new players as well and i think the single biggest thing that's stopping us from uh, from really making that vision come alive is this Uh, is this belief that all of us can win in some way or form obviously some will win more and some will win less so like the um, 100 rupee or 400 rupee financial uh, product which obviously doesn't exist in india is there a 100 rupee insurance or what is the high volume low value for you yeah i think uh, uh, you know as you look at two wheeler as you look at uh, travel insurance these are fairly low ticket products when so on a two wheeler transaction uh, someone like us would make about 15 20 rupees right and uh, those transactions are supported are are profitable of course you can't afford call center etc there i think uh, in insurance there is a a very big uh, risk which must be managed as you know the regulators look at it etc whenever i hear of rural insurance i actually get very very scared because see if 90% of this life insurance plus investment products are actually missell the chances of misselling to me is far lower than the chances of misselling it to you know my driver or to somebody else so out there any kind of distribution format that actually expands that product is actually a negative not a positive uh, i think as long as uh, insurance focused on risk and reduced the costs to a, a dynamic per day per month per whatever allowed other people to pay you know quite honestly i believe uh, ekyc etc so i'll give you a very simple example a recent regulation has come out which says ekyc is now uh, compulsory in the digital world for insurance why not for everybody i'll tell you why not because it's not working right now so the problem is works about 30% of customers uh, for tra- transactions and so it doesn't matter if digital dies but there be a big problem and the reason is not being implemented with the rest of the industry is simply because that will cause uproar right but the digital business is 2% of the in- market so you know why bother just 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 roll it out who will cry right so i think uh, somewhere the the regulatory um, alignment to the new world uh, is uh, is extremely necessary in the insurance world and i think the biggest pieces insurance need to understand it's about insurance not about investment uh, it's not about saying hey insurer you can't make money on this insurance so actually you know lap on some investment product and sell it along i think that is the scary part about the industry if i can just add something on the insurance i mean today what 25% of 25% of motor vehicle or two two wheeler insurance gets renewed uh, i'll explain so motorcycle mo- car, cars it's about 60% uh, motorcycles it's about 13% 13% there you so, go so that's why we uh, you know imagine uh, imagine this was a bill just like any other bill 
Yeah, yeah. exactly. Just imagine if it's a bill just like just paid on a monthly basis. Get out of free charge, just pay it, yeah. you're done. So today the biggest reason why it doesn't get renewed is because the ticket size is about 1000 bucks. At that cost, there is no call center, there is no human being who's going to go, go sort of service that uh, particular piece of insurance. And, and really that's the, that's the opportunity that's waiting. It's just like a bill. It's, it's like uh, half the cost of an average postpaid bill for a two-wheeler recharge. But trust me on that also, you know, the consumer inertia, I'm just, I, I agree. The consumer inertia is such, we've run two ads, spent about five, six crore rupees telling the consumer instant motorcycle renewal and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, a few thousand people buy every day compared to almost 10 crore uh, motorcycles out there. So the consumer inertia is still huge, but uh, because the guy says, why should I buy insurance here? You know, it's a 50,000 rupee motorcycle, big hassle talking to the insurance company, getting the claim, etc. When it happens, I'll figure it out. Uh, you know, in most of the country outside of primary metros, police does not necessarily catch anybody. If they catch also, you pay 100 rupees, that is cheaper than buying the insurance. So, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, it's, my, my point again is, it may be about convenience, but I don't believe it is about convenience. It is actually about the consumer wanting to buy. Uh, because if he wanted to buy, there are enough avenues. You know, every every petrol pump, you could pretty much renew your insurance. But, but yeah.